Thank you again for joining us, and now I will turn it over to Gary LeBranch, President and CEO of the Association for Corporate Growth. Thank you, and welcome to this joint uh, webinar hosted by ACG and the Bureau of Economic Analysis. With me today is staff with the Bureau of Economic Analysis. We have Patricia Abora, Chief of the Direct Investment Division, and Mark Goddard, Chief of the Foreign Operations Sections of BEA. In addition, today's moderator is ACG's Outside Regulatory Counsel, Scott Gluck, Counsel with Venable LLP. As background, the Bureau of Economic Analysis, or BEA, housed within the U.S. Department of Commerce, conducts a benchmark survey every five years of U.S. direct investment abroad. U.S.-based companies with ownership of foreign affiliates are required by law to participate in the survey by completing and submitting a series of forms known as the BE-10 survey. Private funds are required to participate in the BE-10 survey if they own foreign affiliates directly or through U.S. portfolio companies that they control. Failure to comply with the BE-10 reporting requirements could result in civil penalties ranging from $2,500 to $25,000. A willful violation could result in a $10,000 penalty and or imprisonment of up to one year. Over the past several weeks, members of ACG have raised concerns and questions about complying with the benchmark of Direct Investment Abroad Survey. Thanks to the ACG Private Equity Regulatory Task Force, uh, they have provided incredible uh, input and advice along with many other members. That, that is why we're doing this webinar today, which will help to explain the filing requirements and offer tips and answer questions to assist private funds in completing the survey. I want to thank um, the BEA for participating in today's webinar. Uh, they uh, have been very uh, generous with their time and have been very helpful in clarifying aspects of the survey and we look forward to them bringing further light to the process. I now turn it over to Scott Gluck to help us get started. Thanks, Gary. <clears throat> Once again, we want to thank Patricia Abaroa and Mark Goddard from the Bureau of Economic Analysis for joining us today for what we hope and expect is going to be a very timely, helpful, and informative webinar describing how the BE-10 survey applies to private funds. As Gary mentioned, Patricia is chief of the BEA's Direct Investment Division and Mark is chief of the foreign operations section in the direct investment division. So they're BEA's point people on the BE10 form, and we're very pleased that they've taken the time to be with us today. The agenda for today's webinar is we'll have Patricia and Mark first provide a general overview of the BE10 survey, describe the data that's collected and what BEA does with it, explain who's required to report as part of the BE10 survey, describe the various BE10 forms, which you're all hopefully familiar with by now, and review some of the confidentiality aspects of completing the survey. We'll then turn to several issues that are specific to private funds and talk about the consolidated reporting requirement for U.S. reporters, particularly the fact that many private funds use investment company accounting under GAAP instead of equity or cost accounting. And then we'll go into detail on some of the private fund FAQs that are on BEA's website. We then want to walk through a few of the basic private fund organizational charts to cover how the survey applies to common fund structures. So we'll walk through the basic fund structure, uh, what happens when there's an outside manager, go through a parallel fund structure, a master feeder fund structure, and treatment of individuals where two or three individuals own a management company or a GP to several onshore and offshore funds. There are, of course, an infinite number of variations on these organizational charts, and we obviously can't cover every scenario, but the hope is that providing a basic overview will help you apply these principles to your own specific situation. Uh, now a few housekeeping items. Neither BA, ACG, nor I are giving any legal advice in this webinar. The information being provided is to help inform you as to the various aspects of the BE-10 survey, but again, no legal advice is being given. Private funds should discuss this, the BE-10 survey with their outside legal counsel. Uh, legal counsel tends to be very, very smart and uh, talk to them as to how they should comply with the regulations given their particular situation. We are soliciting questions uh, from the audience, so those of you listening and watching are encouraged to submit questions via the chat feature, and we will do our best to have the questions answered. However, please make sure that when you, what you submit is actually a question, not a comment or opinion. Patricia and Mark have been very generous with their time in terms of preparing the webinar and drafting the slides, so please, no venting, just questions only. And finally, we received a few questions regarding the BE-180 survey, 
which measures financial services transactions between U.S. financial services providers and foreign persons. Responses to the B-180 are currently due on October 1st, 2015. Um, a di different division of VEA handles the BE-180 survey, and that division expects to provide guidance in the next few weeks. So we're not going to be covering the BE-180 survey, nor are we going to be covering the BE-15 survey, which may be relevant for private funds that have foreign affiliates, which themselves have U.S. subsidiaries. And so with that, I'd like to turn it over to Patricia and Mark to talk about the BE-10 survey. Hey, thanks, Scott. Thanks, Gary. This is Patricia Abaroa, uh, Chief of Direct Investment Division at BEA. And um, BEA is an agency of the Commerce Department, and we produce key U.S. economic statistics, such as GDP. And uh, the Direct Investment Division conducts surveys that are the basis of the U.S. official statistics on U.S. direct investment abroad and on foreign direct investment in the United States and BEA is the only source of, of these U.S. direct investment statistics. Um, BEA's surveys of U.S. direct investment abroad are conducted to collect current economic data on the operations and financial structure of U.S. parent companies and on their foreign affiliates. BEA collects this data annually from U.S. companies with larger foreign affiliates on the BE11 survey. Related data are collected quarterly on the BE577 survey and every fifth year, BEA conducts a benchmark survey of U.S. direct investment abroad, known as the BE-10, to collect data from U.S. companies with affiliates both large and small. And again, uh, you'll all be happy to know that these are not the only surveys that are relevant for private funds. There are also the BE-180 and BE-15 forms, which are outside the scope of this webinar, but those should also be on private funds' uh, radars as well, particularly the BE-180, which is due October 1st. Right. Uh, the BE-10 collects uh, financial and operating data items from the U.S. reporter, the U.S. company, and its foreign affiliates on the BE-10 form. And the financial data include assets, liabilities, sales, and net income. Some of the operating data include operational structure, products and services, employment, and industry code. The BEA produces comprehensive statistics on U.S. direct investment abroad that are essential to the compilation of the U.S. economic accounts and for the analysis of the activities of U.S. multinational companies. And the statistics are derived from data collected on the, sur on the survey. They're, uh, they're disaggregated by uh, country and by industry. They're used to measure the scale of the global business activity of U.S. multinational impact, uh, enterprises and their impact on the U.S. economy and on foreign host economies and are important for making informed business and policy decisions. And Patricia, can you please elaborate on some of the types of policy decisions that are made based upon the data you receive from the BE10 survey? Yes. Um, so BEA's uh, BE10 survey are used by several U.S. government agencies, including the Treasury Department and the State Department, the Council of Economic Advisors, and the Federal Reserve Board to support U.S. international economic policy. And they're used, for example, heavily during um, bilateral investment treaty negotiations. So uh, what companies need to file this survey? All U.S. persons that own a foreign affiliate, that is, that had ownership of at least 10% of the voting stock in a foreign business enterprise, must file the BE-10 survey. And a U.S. person is any individual or entity that resides in the United States or is subject to the jurisdiction of the United States. And then put in the, in the context of the survey, the U.S. person, this owner, is referred to as a U.S. reporter. A foreign affiliate is any business enterprise located outside the United States in which a U.S. person had 10% or more, or more voting interest. Each U.S. reporter files a BE-10 form, a BE-10A form, for the fully consolidated U.S. domestic business enterprise. And each U.S. reporter files a BE-10 B, C, or D form for each of its foreign affiliates. Which B, C, or D form to file for a particular affiliate will depend on two factors. First, whether the affiliate is majority or minority owned by the U.S. reporter. And second, the size of the foreign affiliate as measured by their assets, sales, or net income. 
So generally the expectation is that each private fund firm will be filing one BE10A and then each of the foreign affiliates will be filing a separate B, C, or D, correct? Um, that's right. So the, the entity that's required to file is the U.S. reporter, so they would file one and only one form for their domestic operations and then one or more forms for each of their foreign uh, units. And, and just to clarify, it will be a BE10A form for the domestic operations and a BC or D form for the foreign operations. That's right. So uh, legal authority, the, uh, the BE-10 is conducted under the authority of the International Investment and Trade and Services Survey Act, and under this law, the filing of reports is mandatory. Some BEA surveys, including the BE-10, are required to be filed by persons meeting the reporting requirements, whether or not they are contacted by BEA. And you've noted that each that the it's the U.S. reporter that's responsible for the filing of the BE-10, B, C, or D by each foreign affiliate. Is the U.S. reporter responsible for a failure by the foreign affiliate to respond? Yes, they are. The, the law applies to the U.S. entity, and they they re, they report on behalf of the foreign entities. And what if the U.S. reporter uses best efforts to get the foreign affiliate to respond, but perhaps it's a minority owner, and for some reason or other, the foreign affiliate just doesn't respond, respond, notwithstanding the U.S. reporter's best efforts? Okay, so we yeah we do expect the the reporter to reach out to their foreign affiliate for the information that they would need to complete the form or to complete the form on their behalf, but it is ultimately the responsibility of the U.S. entity, so if they can't get the information from the foreign affiliate, then we would expect them to file a form with their best estimate of the, the data on behalf of the foreign affiliate. Uh, so the data are collected on the survey are confidential. BEA cannot publish or otherwise release the data collected on its surveys in a way that would allow the data of an individual respondent to be identified. Data may only be used for statistical and analytical purposes, and BEA is prohibited from granting another agency access to the data for tax or investigative or regulatory processes. And um, data from BEA surveys are not subject to Freedom of Information Act requests. So if a private fund's concerned about protecting the confidentiality of the data it provides, are there affirmative steps that it can take? So we suggest using secure methods for communicating with BEA. So we take, and uh, so, you know, uh, we have a secure messaging system for, for uh, questions. We suggest that if you're, if you, you know, if you're not going to use that system that you call us with a question. Um, we don't recommend submitting forms by email. They should be mailed or faxed or e-filed. Um, and then once the form is here, we take confidentiality very seriously. For producing good statistics, which is what all this is for, depends on respondents trusting us with their confidential information, otherwise they wouldn't provide it. And uh, BEA employees are subject to legal pen penalties for intentional or unintentional breaches. Uh, so one of the questions we've been hearing a lot from private funds, uh, particularly private equity funds, relates to consolidation rules. Consolidated domestic information is needed to provide a comprehensive picture of a U.S. multinational enterprise. And the fully consolidated U.S. domestic business enterprise includes all domestic business enterprises that are majority owned by the U.S. reporter. So we've gotten about a dozen responses or questions along the lines of, is BEA aware that uh, PE firms generally don't consolidate the financial information of the funds with its portfolio companies? So just for the record, you guys are aware of the fact, right? Yes, definitely. We've gotten a lot, a lot more than 12. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're aware that private equity funds don't consolidate for other purposes and that, that they're doing a, you know, kind of custom calculations for our for our survey, and we do have some suggestions, which we'll go over later on in the presentation, for how they can how they can do that in a reasonable way. So, um, so in terms of what we're expecting in the consolidation, the uh, top U.S. in the fully consolidated domestic U.S. business enterprise, we would expect to see the top U.S. business that is not majority owned by another U.S. business. If you're proceeding up the ownership chain of, a, of a, US, a series of U.S. companies that own each other, the top one, and then coming down from that top one, you're proceeding down each ownership chain, any U.S. business enterprise whose voting securities 
are majority owned by the U.S. business above it, and so that would include um, businesses that you know that don't have any foreign affiliates at all. Okay, and this um, here we have an organizational chart uh, to illustrate what I just explained. So uh, in this chart, U.S. business enterprise C owns a foreign affiliate. So this company must file the BE10 survey. And U.S. business enterprises B, C, and D are consolidated on one BE10A form and are considered to be one U.S. reporter because U.S. Enterpri business enterprise B owns more than 50% of U.S. businesses C and D. U.S. Business A is not considered to be part of the consolidated U.S. domestic enterprise and therefore should not be included on the BE-10A because it does not own more than 50% of the voting stock of U.S. Business B. The foreign affiliate is not included in the consolidation because it is located outside of the United States. A BE-10, B, C, or D form needs to be completed for the foreign affiliate. For this company, a complete BE-10 filing includes two forms. And so uh, if we were to assume that this were to be a, a private fund and actually business A was the GP and it did own more than 50%, B was the fund and then C and D were both portfolio companies, it, the only thing that would change is that then the U.S. reporter would be business A and it would report the consolidated information for A, B, C, and D and the foreign affiliate files of B, C, or D, correct? That's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. And, and if business A had a foreign affiliate of its own, that it owned outside of this structure, then it would be a filer, but it would only be filing for that one foreign affiliate. Okay, so uh, I'm going to pass it along to Mark Goddard, and he's going to go over some of the frequently asked questions that we have received regarding private funds. Hello, everyone. Again, it's Mark Goddard, Chief of the Foreign Operations Section, and uh, I'll start with the first private fund FAQ. My company's last client is a private fund that has a foreign investment. Am I required to submit the BE-10 survey? Yes, all U.S. persons, private funds included, that meet the BE-10 reporting requirements need to file a BE-10 report. Per the benchmark survey of U.S. Direct Investment Abroad Instruction Booklet, a BE-10 report is required of any U.S. person that had a foreign affiliate, that is, that had an ownership or control of at least 10% of the voting stock of an incorporated foreign business enterprise or an equivalent interest in an unincorporated foreign business enterprise at any time during the U.S. person's 2014 fiscal year. And that is on page one of the BE-10 instruction booklet, just to let you all know. If a U.S. private fund parent had at least 10% voting interest in a foreign business enterprise, including a fund, it must report regardless of whether it had an, any economic interest in the foreign fund. An investment manager may be a U.S. parent if it meets these criteria. So just confirm, a uh, private fund may have to file, regardless of whether it's a hedge fund, if it crosses the ownership threshold for having to file, a real estate fund that meets the definition of having invested in a quote-unquote foreign business enterprise, a family office, or even a mezzanine fund, uh, depending on whether it meets the threshold of uh, voting interest of 10% or gra of greater than 10%, correct? Yes, so yes, it's the, the trigger is the 10% uh, or greater voting interest in a foreign uh, business enterprise or foreign entity. So let's move along to the next private fund FAQ. If it is determined that a private fund must complete the 2014 BE-10 survey, which forms are required? The same BE-10 filing requirements apply to private funds as to other domestic and foreign entities. The fully consolidated U.S. domestic business enterprise is reported on the BE-10A form. Each foreign affiliate is reported on a B, C, or D form depending on two factors, whether the affiliate is a majority or minority owned by the U.S. reporter and the size of the foreign affiliate, which is based on the size of assets, sales, or net income of the foreign affiliate. This chart from the BE-10 instruction booklet shows the criteria for the B, C, and D forms. Form BE-10B is a report for majority-owned foreign affiliates with assets, sales, or net income greater than 80 million. Form BE-10C 
is the report for majority-owned foreign affiliates with asset sales or net income between $25 million and $80 million, and for minority-owned foreign affiliates with asset sales or net income greater than $25 million. Form BE10D is the report for foreign affiliates for which asset sales or net income were all below $25 million. I did really want to reemphasize that the BE10C form can be for majority or minority-owned affiliates on the BD10 benchmark survey. So on to the next FAQ. How do the filing requirements for the BE10 apply if a private fund is structured as a limited partnership? The determination of percentage of voting interest in a general or limited partnership is based on who controls the partnership. The partnership of voting interest is not based on the percentage of ownership and the partnership's equity. A limited partnership usually consists of at least one general partner and one limited partner. The general partner usually controls a limited partnership and therefore has 100% voting interest in the limited partnership. Limited partners do not normally exercise any control over a partnership. Therefore, unless a clause to the contrary is contained in the partnership agreement, limited partners are presumed to have zero voting interest in a partnership. In the context of a fund, some master funds may be limited partnerships, the U.S. Journal partners considered the U.S. reporter. So how do I determine which U.S.-based private fund entity, entity or manager would be the U.S. reporter that is required to complete the 2014 BE10A report for the U.S. reporter? If a U.S. private fund parent had at least 10% voting interest in a foreign business enterprise, including a fund, it must report regardless of whether it had an economic interest in the foreign business enterprise. If a U.S. investment manager has a majority voting interest in several U.S. funds and one or more of these funds meet the filing requirements for the BE10 survey, the U.S. investment manager and the majority-owned U.S. funds must be consolidated on one BE10A form. However, if a U.S. investment manager manages or advises but does not have majority voting interest in several U.S. funds, these, these entities should separately file the BE10A if they meet the filing requirement for the BE10 survey. So in different funds, the investment manager and the general partner play different roles, uh, assuming there's an external investment manager. In some, the investment manager is the owner, but in other instances, the general partner would just contract out to the investment manager to handle investment-related activities. How do you distinguish between whether the manager has a majority voting interest or is a service provider, as you've indicated on the slide? So the BEA relies on the respondent to determine whether the investment manager has a voting interest in the fund. Um, so it's kind of up to um, the respondent to determine whether that voting, entry, um, voting interest exists. Um, and once they've looked into that based on their um, organizational charts or ownership structures, then we are definitely happy to offer our assistance if there's any uncertainty based on the structures that are being looked at um, to, to distinguish between the voting interest and uh, the uh, equity or economic interest. So we're happy to help um, if that's the case. But in generally, the threshold is going to hinge on whether the external manager has majority voting interest. Correct. Correct. That's the yes. So on to the next private fund FAQ. How do I complete a survey for a foreign entity that is a private fund versus an operating company? Private funds and operating companies use the same forms for filing the BE10 survey. The BE10A, B, C, and D forms are intended to cover many different types of entities across all industries, including traditional operating companies, holding companies, funds, such as feeder funds, master funds, and other funds. The 2014 BE10 survey forms appear to contain numerous questions that may not apply to my domestic and foreign funds slash entities. How do I proceed? Not all questions on the forms may apply to your domestic or foreign entities. Respondents may leave these items blank if they do not apply to their entities and provide explanation about the nature of the entities and their operations and one of the remarks areas on the forms. So I think the main takeaway here is that the U.S. reporter doesn't have an obligation to respond to each and every question on the form 10A. Um, if there's a good faith 
reason to believe that a question on one of the forms today is not applicable, then they should leave it blank and note that in the remarks section. Yeah, they should definitely leave those areas blank. Um, some example, examples of that are, you know, areas on the form that ask for research, research and development, um, as well as uh, import and export trade data that's asked for. Um, those items would obviously be left blank on the survey form. Those are just a few examples of items that would not be applicable. So on to the next FAQ. Does the 2014 BE10 reporting overlap with the Treasury International Capital, also known as TIC, reporting for private funds? No, it does not. As a benchmark survey, BE10 covers direct investment transactions and positions between U.S.-owned foreign business enterprises and their U.S. parents. TIC, on the other hand, collects data on international portfolio flows and the positions between U.S. residents and foreign residents. The BE10 and TIC surveys share the same definition for direct investment, and the data collected typically complement each other. In addition, the BE10 covers data on the financial structure and operations of U.S. parents and their foreign affiliates. TIC does not collect this type of data. So as a private equity fund, I don't have the information on our other U.S. portfolio companies that is needed to file the BE10A report for the fully consolidated U.S. domestic business enterprise. What should I do? If you do not have all the information of the U.S. portfolio companies your private fund is investing in, you could have each portfolio company provide their information to you on a BE10A form and then add them up to produce a single BE10A form. Again, that would be added up to produce one single BE10A form on behalf of the private equity firm. Make sure to include the top private equity firm level values as well as the consolidated domestic report. While a true consolidation requires the elimination of intercompany transactions, in practice these are very rare between portfolio companies of a private equity fund, so the multiple A forms can simply be aggregated. The U.S. portfolio level companies can also help and filling out the BE10 B, C, or D forms for their foreign affiliates. To help illustrate this, let's study the diagram displayed. The diagram displays a U.S. limited partnership fund owning 100% of the voting interest of two U.S. portfolio companies. The U.S. LP fund also owns a foreign affiliate. One of the U.S. portfolio companies also owns two foreign affiliates. U.S. Portfolio Companies 1 and 2 can each complete a separate BE10A form and provide them to private funds where they can be added with its own data to provide the consolidated domestic report. Foreign Affiliate 3, which is directly owned by the top fund, can prepare a B, C, or D form to, to submit to BEA. U.S. Portfolio Company 1 can assist in filling out the B, BE10, B, C, or D forms for Foreign Affiliates 1 and 2. On to another private fund FAQ. What if some of the data items requested on the BE10 survey forms are difficult to obtain? If you can't get certain data for a particular item on the survey, please provide estimates and label them as such. When data items cannot be fully subdivided as required, provide totals and an estimated breakdown of the totals. If another accounting standard is used besides US GAAP, you may provide data using the other standard if it is a reasonable approximation for a gap and make adjustments for material differences. So one of the key problem areas that our members have mentioned is that the instructions generally require either cost accounting or equity accounting. And investment partnerships generally follow investment company accounting and reporting guidance of ASC 946 and record their investments at fair value in accordance with ASC 820. And so there was some concern that the funds might need to go back in several years to recreate the financial records or the portfolio companies to get it in line with cost or equity um, accounting. And so what you're saying is that a private firm does not need to do that. If it uses investment company accounting methodology, it can use a good faith estimate instead? Yes, that is correct. Good faith estimates can be used um, based on um, the, how they currently keep their uh, accounting records. They can go back and try to use best faith best faith estimates. Good. I think you're hearing a lot of cheers coming up from the other. Good. 
good. So um, now we thought that we would go through a few basic organizational charts to help illustrate some of the different fact patterns that people on the audience might have. That sounds great. This is what I call the fun part and exciting part of this webinar. So uh, you're ready to enjoy the ride. <laughs> so for organizational chart one here, this organizational structure displays a U.S. limited partnership fund owning 100% of the voting interest of U.S. portfolio companies one, two, and three. U.S. portfolio company three owns 100% of the voting interest and foreign affiliate one. The fully consolidated domestic business enterprise to be, be completed on the BE-10A form and this organizational structure includes the U.S. Limited Partnership Fund and U.S. Portfolio Companies 1, 2, and 3 as displayed in the circled area of this slide because each of these companies is majority owned by the U.S. LP Fund. A BE-10B, C, or D form must be completed for foreign affiliate number one. So the key takeaway is that, as we mentioned, if a private fund has a single portfolio company with a foreign affiliate, the firm is required to complete the BE-10 survey. The U.S. owner, the U.S. reporter files the BE-10A. The firm consolidates the information from all of the U.S. portfolio companies. None of the U.S. portfolio companies need to file a BE-10 B, C, or D, and the parent, the U.S. reporter is responsible for ensuring that the foreign affiliate files a BE-10 B, C, or D. That is correct. You've highlighted some good points there, Scott. Thank you. <laughs> so on to organizational chart two. This organizational structure displays principals or individuals owning 100% of the voting interest of an investment manager and a U.S. general partner LLC. The U.S. GP LLC owns 100% of the voting interest of a U.S. limited partnership fund. The U.S. limited partnership fund owns 100% of the voting interest of U.S. Portfolio Companies 1, 2, and 3. U.S. Portfolio Company 1 owns 100% of foreign affiliate number 1. This is organizational structure displays principals or individuals owning 100% of the voting interest of an investment manager and a U.S. General Partner LLC. The U.S. GP LLC owns 100% of the voting interest of a U.S. Limited Partnership Fund. The U.S. Limited Partnership Fund owns 100% of the voting interest of 1, 2, and 3. U.S. Portfolio Company 1 owns foreign affiliate 1. So I've actually repeated myself there. My apologies. Um, but in this structure, um, the U.S. principal and U.S. manager will not be included in the consolidation for the A-form requirement. Um, due to the um, – on the BE-10 instruction booklet, those two entities um, – because they're um, because they own a GP, an LLC, or a company, they do not have the filing requirement, and that is found on page two of the BE10 instruction booklet to point that out. Um, so the principals and individuals are excluded from the BE10 filing requirement, as well as the investment manager. When a U.S. individual owns more than 50% of a U.S. business enterprise that in turn owns a foreign affiliate then the U.S. reporters need to be the U.S. business enterprise, not the individual. And again, that is page two of the instructions. Um, the fully consolidated domestic business enterprise to be completed on the BE-10A form and this organizational structure includes the U.S. GP, LLC, U.S. Limited Partnership Fund, and U.S. Portfolio Companies 1, 2, and 3 as displayed in the shaded area of the diagram. The principals or individuals are excluded from the BE-10 filing requirement as well as the investment manager, just to repeat that, they, are, they will not be included. And a BE10B, BE10C, or BE10D form must be completed for foreign affiliate one. So moving on to organizational chart number three, um, this is one of the fun ones, by the way. <laughs> so this organizational structure displays principals or individuals owning a U.S. investment manager. The U.S. investment manager owns a U.S. journal partner. The U.S. GP owns a U.S. fund. The U.S. fund owns portfolio companies one, two, and three. The U.S. investment manager also owns foreign affiliate number one, which owns foreign affiliate two, which then in return owns foreign affiliate three, four, and five. The principals or individuals are excluded from the BE-10 filing requirement for the same reason as discussed in the organizational chart number two. 
the fully consolidated domestic business enterprise to be completed on the BE 10A form. And this organizational structure includes the U.S. Manager, U.S. GP LLC, U.S. Fund, and U.S. Portfolio Companies 1, 2, and 3 as displayed in the boxes shaded areas to the left. Five separate B, C, or D forms need to be filed for foreign affiliates 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. Great, and we've received a number of questions among the lines of does every foreign affiliate need to submit its own BE 10 B, C, or D, or can some of those forms be consolidated? Generally, generally yes, as a separate B, C, or D must be filed for the year's reporter for each foreign affiliate. Under certain circumstances, two or more of these may be combined into one B, C, or D form. You can find those criteria in the BE 10 instruction booklet. And that's actually located on page three. There's a chart there to walk you through the rules of consolidation uh, that are allowable for the BE 10 survey forms. So moving on to organizational chart four. This organizational structure displays U.S. principals or individuals owning 100% of the voting interest of a U.S. journal partner LLC. The, U the U.S. GP LLC owns 100% of the voting interest of a U.S. feeder fund and the foreign master fund. The U.S. and foreign feeder funds each have 50% of the equity of the foreign master fund. The foreign master fund owns foreign affiliate one. The U.S. principal or individuals are excluded from the BE-10 filing requirements, as mentioned before. The fully consolidated domestic enterprise to be completed on the BE-10A form and this organ organizational structure includes the U.S. GP LLC and the U.S. feeder fund. The U.S. feeder is consolidated because it is controlled by the U.S. GP LLC. A separate BE 10B, C, or D form needs to be completed for the foreign master fund and foreign affiliate one. The foreign feeder fund does not have a filing requirement since there is no voting control by a U.S. person. And so what if the U.S. principles that controlled U.S. GP LLC1 also controlled an offshore, let's say, Cayman GP that was the GP of the foreign feeder fund, uh, would it still not to need to submit any forms? In that case, a U.S. parent A form would need to be completed on behalf of the principal or individuals. And I just want to spell out that um, only as questions slash items 1, 2, and 5 need to be completed on that A form. That is per page two of the BE-10 instruction booklet. And the Cayman GP and foreign feeders funds would each file a B, C, or D form. That's a good question, Scott. Thank you. So on to the last organizational chart, which is five. This organizational structure displays U.S. individuals, one, two, and three, each owning 33.3% of the voting interest of a foreign GP. The foreign GP owns 100% of the voting interest of foreign affiliate one. Each of these three individuals has at least 10% voting interest in a foreign affiliate. These three individuals may file a single BE-10A form as an associated group. BEA collects no data on individuals, so only questions slash items one, two, and five must be completed on the BE-10A form. Separate B, 10 B, C, or D forms need to be completed for the foreign GP and the foreign affiliate. So that concludes the organizational structures. Um, if you require additional assistance, please feel free to reach us at the contact information provided on this slide. Um, we are now going to answer some questions that you have been asking throughout this webinar. So one question we got, um, can we use the investment manager of our affiliated funds as the U.S. reporter rather than the holding company above the investment manager? Our investment advisor isn't our top company where the business is fully consolidated and the holding company is jointly owned by third parties who would also be deemed indirect owner of the foreign assets. So if the holding, if the holding company has a majority interest in the investment manager and no other entity is a majority owner of the holding company, then you, then you would do the consolidation at the holding company level. If the other owners of the holding company have no direct interest in a foreign affiliate, only the interest that they own through a U.S. holding company, then they are not required to file the BE-10. Okay. 
Another question, um, we sort of covered this already, but may we limit our filings for offshore entities for the BE10B, Cs and Ds to those entities, quote unquote, first across the border in complex investment fund structures? So all foreign affiliates that a U.S. reporter owns either directly or indirectly through another foreign affiliate must be reported. So both the directly held, first, yeah, first across the border filed for a BC or D form, as well as those that are indirectly owned through another foreign affiliate would also have a filing requirement for a BC Sub or D form. Subjects of consolidation um, guidance that you have in the instruction book. Correct. So which is, uh, yes, which is found on page three of right. instructions. Yes, correct, Scott. All right. Um, if a U.S. partnership has a foreign affiliate, would the U.S. partnership file the BE-10 or would the U.S. owners of the U.S. partnership file the BE-10? They're assuming it's the BE-10A. Right. So the, the partnership, if the general partners would be the owners of the partnership. And so the, the general partner and the partnership would be consolidated on a BE-10A form and then they would file for their foreign affiliate on a B, C, or D form. Uh, a and B are U.S. corporations, and A wholly owns B. B has a foreign affiliate. Does A or B complete the BE-10 survey? So in this case, since A wholly owns B, um, U.S. corporations A and B are filed on one single BE-10A form for the fully consolidated U.S. domestic business enterprise. So A and B together are filing a um, BE-10A form, a single BE-10A consolidated, and then a separate BE10B, C, or D form is completed for the foreign affiliate. Okay. If a husband and wife own a foreign rental property, do both husband and wife have to file separate BE10 surveys or can they file jointly? So in this case where the husband and wife um, own the foreign rental property, the husband and wife can file as an associated group on a single BE10A form. And I definitely want to highlight again on that A form, there's limited burden there. They only need to complete item plus questions one, two, and five as an associated group on the A form. And then most likely the foreign rental property would go on a BE 10 D form. And that's the shortest of our forms. Yes. So very limited burden in that in that example on, on a filer. Please clarify control versus ownership making the GP the required reporter. Right, so what, what we're interested in these surveys, because the surveys of direct investment, is what are the U.S. entities that are controlling foreign entities that are making business decisions about foreign companies? And so we want to, that's why we consider the GP the reporter, even if they don't have an economic interest. Does a foreign affiliate include a non-entity, unincorporated branch abroad of a U.S. MNC or entities only? So the foreign affiliate must be a business, and, and that can include a branch. And our instruction booklet does have um, criteria for determining whether a foreign entity could be considered a foreign affiliate, and we recommend that you review those instructions. Yeah, and please note, and within that criteria, only one of those criteria need to be met. Um, as stated in the instructions to define a foreign affiliate. Mm -hmm. um, so a few of those criteria may not be met, uh, but if one of them is met, then most likely that it is, it is deemed a foreign affiliate. Did want to point that out. Okay. You've mentioned that estimates are permissible when it's difficult getting the information. Do you have to say what you base the estimates on? Typically, we don't require for you to say what you base the estimate on, but it, it's most important for us to know um, if you have made estimates in certain areas. So as we stated earlier in the webinar, within the remarks section of one of the remarks sections of the survey forms, you could just mention that, you know, part four, part three, whatever part that might be an estimate would be helpful to, for us to know whether a particular part of the form um, is an estimate, just so we have that information. Does VA encrypt the data that it collects from U.S. reporters? Yes, we do. We take very good care of that data once it's here. We take that very seriously, and so we use all kinds of um, all kinds of. Uh, I'm not an IT person, but we do we do take that very seriously. Yeah. What are the guidelines, suggestions around foreign affiliates with fiscal years not 1231? For that matter, when consolidating multiple domestic portfolio companies, how should different fiscal periods be handled? So in that case. Um, you know, just as an example for the first part of the question, if you have a March 31st, 20, 
uh, March 31st fiscal year end date, then we want your data provided to us as of March 31st, 2014 um, for the BE10 um, 2014 survey forms. Um, to add on to the second part of the question, if there's multiple fiscal years for consolidation, then we want a best estimate um, based on a full year of data for each of those U.S. entities that are consolidating um, or foreign entities if you're doing a foreign consolidation. It would just make sure that you're using your um, best estimated full year worth of data to do that consolidation. Okay. Uh, what about the circumstance where the domestic entity holds 100% of the voting shares of a foreign affiliate and that foreign affiliate owns a greater than 50% interest in a domestic entity? Does that domestic entity need to be consolidated into the 10A filing? We touched upon this briefly in talking about the BE15 requirements where a uh, foreign affiliate has uh, interest in U.S.-based portfolio companies. So. Yeah, so, so in that case, that is correct. So there would be a BE15 requirement. So just let me highlight that example again. You have a U.S. entity at the top that owns 100% of a foreign affiliate, and then that foreign affiliate in return owns 100% of another U.S. entity. So in that structure, there would be um, an A form for the top affiliate, the 10A form, and then a B, C, or D for the foreign affiliate. And then the next layer of where that foreign affiliate owns U.S., there would be a BE15 filing requirement on behalf of the U.S. parent um, for that filing. So the, the BE15 is the annual survey of foreign direct investment in the United States, so that covers U.S. entities that are owned by a foreign investor. And so in this case, the foreign affiliate would be the foreign investor, and that, that U.S. entity is considered to be foreign-owned, and, and the B15 is a topic probably right. for another webinar, Correct. but that is... That but in looking at the BE10 filing by the foreign affiliate, do they include on their BE10, B, C, or D the U.S. data, the data of the U.S. company? Not to get too complicated, but they would include the income and equity okay. roll-up from that U.S. entity that they, that they own. Don't want to get too complicated. So they're, there, not, they they, they're, they're not going to report, say, their employees on the employee line or their, you know, R&D on the R&D line or their trade. But it, the assets of that U.S. entity are on the balance sheet of the foreign entity. So in terms of, and, and their income is in the income statement. So in that respect, it would be, would be included. So some of the information. Yeah. yeah. Okay, great. Uh, I think you should remind the audience that the foreign affiliate never files 10B, Cs, or Ds directly with BA. The U.S. owner is that party that files the 10A and the and the 10B, Cs, and Ds on behalf of the foreign affiliate. That's, that's, yeah. that's correct. That's a good reminder. Yep. Just to make sure it's the responsibility of the U.S. reporter to get their foreign affiliates to file. And if they're having trouble with that, um, you know, it's, 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 it's good to kind of share that information from the, all the BE10 resources that are available on the webpage to the foreign affiliates and just let them know and make them aware of the, of the filing requirement that the U.S. reporter is taking part in or has to take part in. What if a foreign affiliate went out of business in 2014 so there's no full year financials or other operating data? So the way our forms operate, even if the foreign affiliate, let's just say it had a calendar year in, but the foreign affiliate went out of business at the end of February of 2014, we still require that the survey form is completed um, obviously, uh, in this case, there would be zero balances for the balance sheet, but we would get two months of income statement information um, in the example where if a foreign affiliate uh, liquidated in the in February um, with a calendar year in. So we still would be, they still would be required to complete a limited amount of the BE-10 survey forms, B, C, or D form. Okay, we're running up about 10 minutes left, but we still have a number of questions. So does a check-the-box entity, Cayman Island Holding Company, need to have the 10 B, C, or D filed? Yeah, so that, that we've gotten this question. I, I believe that these are companies that maybe aren't considered for tax purposes, that kind of thing, but we we don't have that uh, exception in our survey. So if there's a foreign business out there, regardless of what box they checked, they should file. <laughs> LPs in uh, private funds generally have zero voting interest. That said, nearly every private fund limited partnership agreement affords the LP some voting rights, like to remove the GP or termination. Can you please confirm that those voting rights do not trigger ownership of a voting interest? That's right. It's just yep. standard rights that a limited partner has um, don't, are not considered voting interest, but there are 
very rarely we've seen partnership agreements that give the limited partners more rights, and um, but but we don't see those too often. Correct. Mm -hmm. Is there a deconsolidated filing available to U.S. funds so each reporting silo in a fund can be reported separately? No, that's not something that we do. Yeah, we need we need a fully consolidated U.S. domestic uh, enterprise within the uh, file on the BB10A form. But if there are a fund, firm with unique circumstances, they can contact you. We. We have, um, on very rare occasions, given an exception, but it typically is because a company recently went through a merger and they had been filing a thus as two separate companies and they haven't sort of sorted out all the accounting yet. Um, that's really the only case that we've that we've granted in, in recent memory. Okay. Um, when determining total assets for the investment manager of the funds, i.e., the fully consolidated U.S. domestic business enterprise. Does the investment advisor's other domestic funds fall under the definition of U.S. domestic enterprise and need to be consolidated for purposes of calculating the total assets to determine if it meets the $300 million threshold? These other domestic funds have nothing to do with foreign funds. Yes, they yeah. would be considered part of the consolidated entity. Yep. I'm, I'm glad all these questions are kind of reinforcing the information um, that we went through earlier. Yes. <laughs> Uh, certain firms may have a huge number of filings to make, upwards of 500 and very possibly in the thousands. Is BA considering extensions beyond the August 13th date for such filers? In addition, is BA actually looking to receive this volume of data, um, which will include things like SPVs, special purpose vehicles, and holding companies? Yeah, so the, the August 31st is our final extension date uh, for the year, but we do, we do um, want to receive data on special purpose vehicles and holding companies and other sort of non-typical um, companies. We, that, that is an important part of our data and we do appreciate the effort that respondents are going to go through to complete these forms and, and we're, you know, we're here to answer any questions, provide any help that we can. So again, if there is a firm that has unique circumstances, they might want to contact you. Um, and last question. Is a U.S. citizen who is not a U.S. resident a U.S. reporter? So, under in our with our instructions, if the U.S. citizen um, is not a U.S. resident, then we do not consider them a um, BE10A filer or a BE10 filer if they own foreign entities. Um, U.S. residents, uh, it, it, citizenship doesn't matter. It's based on residency. So in that case, no, a U.S. resident. I mean, a a U.S. It, they have to reside in the United States. So if they're not a U.S. resident, there's no filing requirement. I think we might have one more question okay. here. That one come in? Then, um, could you please explain again why the U.S. principal and U.S. manager are not included in consolidation in organizational charts? Maybe we can back up to org chart two. Yeah, we can we'll take to, a look at that again. Yeah, that sounds good. Okay, so we're now back on organizational chart two. So I'd actually like to kind of quote from our BE10 instruction booklet, which is page two, as to why the U.S. principal or U.S. manager would not be included in this uh, fully domestic U.S. Uh, consolidation for the A form. Um, so if a U.S. individual owns more than 50% of a unit of a U.S. business enterprise that in turn owns a foreign affiliate then the U.S. reporter is deemed to be the U.S. business enterprise, not the individual. Um, so that is why in this case, the U.S. principal owns 100% voting in the U.S. GP LLC. So the U.S. GP LLC or general partner LLC, based on that instruction I read, is deemed the U.S. business enterprise, which then cancels out the U.S. principal and the U.S. Uh, manager as well. Um, so I did want to clarify that um, from the question that was asked. 
So now. All right. Well, again, thank you all very much. Let's do, uh, do there were a number of questions about whether or not these uh, slides would be made available. Caitlin, can you re review that one more time as well as the uh, recording? Yep, the, this webinar was recorded and will be posted on acg.org's content library. We'll also send down an email um, following the webinar so you can find everything at acg.org. Including the PowerPoint slides. Correct. Right. Great. Thank you, Caitlin, for uh, uh, handling the operations of this. And I want to thank uh, Mark and Patricia and uh, Scott Gluck uh, and everyone for participating. Uh, we know there's a lot of questions. We know this is a lot of new information. Um, and uh, we look forward to continuing uh, to support you in your efforts to find the answers. And we'll continue to work with uh, the BEA uh, to uh, clarify things as, as, we, as we come along. So uh, thank you. Good luck. And God bless.